Uh, hi, uh, my name is Dr. Kate Bieberdorf. Most of my students call me Dr. B. You all please call me Kate, except for the student group. Where's the student table? Yeah, I'm Dr. B, okay, yeah, here we go. Um, so I am from the University of Texas at Austin, Hook'em Horns. Do we have any Longhorn fans in here? Good, one. All right, we made it. That's awesome. Um, so I know we're on a clock, so I'm going to go really fast. I speak fast anyway, so I apologize. So if I'm going way too fast, just kind of call me down, and we'll get going, though. All right, so this is what I'm known for. I love fire. Um, I'm not allowed to have fire at all in this building, which is so weird for me because I've literally never done a show ever without fire, so there's a first for everything, so I hope you all like it. Um, we had to kind of change some things up. Um, but how did I get here? Right? You don't just wake up and you're blowing fire out of your mouth. That's not natural. And so I am actually from the Great Lakes State. Um, I am a Michigander, true and true. I'm obsessed with Michigan. So if there aren't any Michigander, one, where are you from? Detroit. Okay. Well, that's the other side, but I'll still take it. That's all right. <laughs> Good enough, I'll take it. Um, so just in case you're not from Michigan, there's three things you need to know. First of all, our state bird is a robin, and it's beautiful, and those usually tell us when the winter is over, so that's fantastic to see a robin. Number two, our state animal is a wolverine. Again, I've never seen one of these, but oh, I want to so, so badly, except for he looks a little nasty, so maybe not too much. The state rock is a Petoskey, and these things are gorgeous. And so actually this summer, um, we spent a little bit of time in Traverse City up here, and my sister is obsessed with rocks and found so many of them. And I think she actually got in trouble with TSA because she had her bags were too heavy with rocks coming home. But anyway, um, there's a lot of science in Petoskey rocks, so if you want to talk to me about it, I'd be happy to talk to you. But... I am from Kalamazoo, and you probably have never heard of it, except for maybe two years ago when that little Uber situation happened. Um, that's not really our claim to fame. I'd rather say that Derek Jeter is from there, um, and Greg Jennings, and hopefully the next Bill Nye. That's the goal. Um, and so I'm from Kalamazoo, and it's my favorite place, except for Austin, but I'll show you Austin in a few seconds. I was born in a fantastic family. That's my mom and dad. They are traveling all over the world right now because they're almost retired, and they're having a great time, but they set me up for success. I have been given every opportunity that I've ever needed, and I'm incredibly grateful for these two people, um, but it started here in Kalamazoo. Then I went to Portage Central High School, and it actually doesn't look like that anymore. They revamped it about a year after I left, so it's sad, but that's where I met this woman. That is Mrs. Kelly Palsrock, and that is one of my favorite people in the entire world. She was my sophomore chemistry teacher in high school, and she is the person who showed me what chemistry can be like. She showed me how amazing it is, and number three, she showed me how to teach, how to actually teach through a classroom of people who hate science. So that's, that's something amazing. And she basically made it so that once I was 15, I knew I was going to be a chemist, and I literally never turned back. So that's a little unusual for my students in the room. Most people switch majors, um, at least at U UT. 80% of students change majors, so if you have, feel, that's very, very normal. I'm just the weird one. That brought me to the University of Michigan, where I double majored in both chemistry and German. I spent a lot of time in the big house, and that's our claim to fame. It's the biggest football stadium, and it's fantastic, and I love it. Um, but my major in German actually allowed me to go spend a little bit of time at the Goethe Institute in Freiburg. And I think this is really a place where I kind of learned how to be an adult and be a human. And if you ever have a chance, students in the room, to study abroad, I would highly encourage it, because I think it's a very good opportunity for you to really learn your true self, especially when you're walking around in Germany trying to speak English with people, and they're like, nice! Nine, 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 and you're just like, I don't know, I don't know, and you get really nervous, but it's fine. That brought me to UT, and I think this is what I now call home. I've been there for, this is my 10th year in Austin, and I just love this university. That's our tower. Um, whenever anything good happens, we light it up in orange, and then we light the windows up in a specific way. When our students graduate, you'll see a 2017 or so on and so forth, and it's just a really thing, cool thing that means a lot to me. So that's the university that I'm trying to represent today. This is where I met my both of my advisors. I originally worked for Alan Cowley when I was studying to get a PhD in inorganic chemistry. He's fantastic. He's the main group king. Unfortunately, after about four years, he started to develop dementia, and I had to get a second co-advisor. So I went from an 80-year-old British man who was incredibly uh, secure and knew exactly what he was doing with his research to a non-tenured professor who was hustling, and all he wanted to do was be a big deal, and so my uh, career trajectory kind of changed a little bit during my fourth year, and I had to take about an extra year of graduate school to try to raise my standards up to what he wanted, and it was 
horrible. It was awful. And it was really, really sad and really challenging. But because of that man, I swear I'm a better chemist. He pushed me so hard. He wanted me to be the best I possibly could. He wouldn't accept this bare minimum standards that I'd been kind of getting by for about three years. And he pushed me. And so I had to do an extra year of grad school. So I almost did a full six years at UT um, studying inorganic chemistry. And so I specifically studied how to make a carbon-carbon bond with Suzuki Mira cross-coupling reaction. Yes. Some of us would? Okay, good. Um, and so I studied, I would make different catalysts. Um, I really like to use the buy-in ligand, and specifically I'm obsessed with palladium, so we use anhydrocyclic carbenes that were attached to palladium. It worked incredibly well, but then I left that. Um, but while I was studying, I actually started my family as well, and so I met the man of my dreams right there on this campus. Um, he's actually over there too. Um, and then we also started our family. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but we also started our family. I don't have kids. I have dogs so that you can look at those. Um, and for those of you who aren't vets, if your dog ever has this leg situation where they're like opening, they've torn their ACL. So if you ever see your dog sitting like that, take them to the vet immediately because, oh my gosh, it gets expensive quickly. Back to here. Okay. So this is what I'm known for. After I graduated at UT, I was lucky enough to kind of stay there. I had to fight tooth and nail for that lecturing position because I love teaching and I love blowing up. It's my favorite thing in the entire world. And so what I do here, and this is usually how I start my show, but you're just going to have to pretend we're doing this, okay? So I take cornstarch in my mouth, put a blowtorch over here, and then I go, oh, oh, yeah, right? Ah, amazing, amazing. And so that is one of my favorite things. So I love to play with fire. And so what I've done at UT is try to develop demonstrations to enhance the instruction. So I teach a general chemistry classroom that has about 500 students today. It's 483, so close enough. Um, but I use demos to try to get them engaged. I heard someone earlier saying, where's the inspiration? It's getting dead in the classroom. I'm like, no, please don't say that. That's the most painful thing to hear from somebody. But you can use demos to enhance the classroom and actually teach these principles. And so what I want to do today is tell you a little bit about the three things I've learned on my chemistry journey and um, three other things that I'll show you in just a second. Why I love chemistry. So usually I say chemistry is explosive and then I do something big, but I can't do that. So today it's electron -fying? Yes? No? Okay. I'll take it. And so what we're going to do here is I'm going to show you my Van de Graaff. And this is something that I love to play with, especially, I'm taking my rings off, sorry honey. Um, <laughs> This is something I love to play with. And I literally, oh, it's getting me down there. Okay. And so this is something that I think is just amazing when you're talking to students and you don't even acknowledge that you're playing with your Van de Graaff. You're just sitting here talking to them. And I usually like to break it out when I'm introducing the concept of something is show. Oh, it's this. Sorry. <laughs> I was like, what is happening? Um, and so I usually start using this to introduce the concept of a power plant. And so I am getting shocked like crazy. Um, and so you just talk about, they understand the concept of going from potential energy to kinetic energy, but they do not get the part about mechanical to electrical. And so if you're just standing here talking to them like this, they're listening, right? They're like, who is this lady? Why is she doing this? And so for those of you who are unfamiliar with this thing, what's happening here, I am getting shocked like crazy, but it's okay. Um, this part right here, <laughs> this right here is our little belt, and we're taking mechanical energy and converting it to electrical energy up here. I don't know how I have that hooked up. Yeah, yeah, you might not. You might not want to do that. Just back up. No, I'll, do it. I'll just stay here. I'm going to do the rest of the lecture here. I'm not getting off because I don't know how this is going to happen. But basically, it's a way to get them excited, and you talk to them, and you're saying, look, I have a mechanical energy right here. I've got a belt. It's moving. And then inside of here, I've got some coils, and there's a magnetic field. And when you have, an uh, when you have the mechanical energy in the presence of a uh, magnetic field, you create electricity, which is Faraday's law, and so all this electrical energy is coming out. And then, oh my gosh, I'm just going to turn it off. Usually I go back and I try to poke around. Yeah, thanks. That's not my best showing. Usually I do better with that, but just take, take it with a grain of salt. Um, but what you can do is you actually show them. You show them electricity was just generated. Yeah, babe. Um, electricity was just generated. And so I was able to create electricity, create transfer energy. But it's a way to illustrate a principle. And so for me, one of the reasons why I love chemistry is, it's, uh, um, you good? is that it's electrifying. Okay, the next one. And this is taboo, so I'm just going to put that out there. I already know people hate this. But to me... Chemistry has an element of magic. And so depending on the scientists you talk to, some of them freak out. They do not like the word magic when you talk about science, which I understand. I totally understand that. 
but in Harry Potter, when they're using copper and they're setting it on fire, that's magic. Okay, that's actually magic. And so, and then when, for a second grader, when they see something, it seems magical. And so you can embrace that, embrace it, and then turn the brain and say it's actually not magic. But if you're a scientist, you can be a wizard or you can be a witch, but you just have to understand what's going on. So let me show you two of the things I do in my classroom. I got to suit up though for this one. So this right here is an Erlenmeyer flask. Ooh, ah. And so what I've done is spiked it with a little bit of phenolphthalein. Um, and then depending on the water of the location that I'm at, sometimes I have to spike it. So now I've heard that New York has the best water because you have the best bagels and you have the best pizza here. And so it's supposed to have good basic water. Um, based on what I grabbed today, you do not have hard water. So either that's the case or you have a very good filter in this building. It's one of the two. So what I had to do was spike it with a little bit of sodium hydroxide. Now what I'm going to do is take a straw. Put it in here. Ooh, ah, okay, there we go. All right, so that's magic, right? There's magic. So we started off with a pink solution. It had a little bit of sodium hydroxide in there, a little bit of phenolphthalein, which is an indicator. And so when I exhale, what comes out of my breath? Okay, it's actually primarily nitrogen, but I'm going to assume you guys already know that. But yeah, 4% carbon dioxide. So the carbon dioxide that comes out of my breath hits this solution, immediately creates carbonic acid. Now, carbonic acid in the presence of a base, bam, neutralization. And so when you have this neutralization, you're able to take it from a basic state to an acidic state, pink to clear. And so you have a little bit of a magical element. And it's a simple, simple transition. But now all of a sudden, the second grader's looking at you. They want to know how to do it, and they want to know how if they can do it. Um, trick at home, for those of you that have kids, you can also do this with dry ice. It's super simple. Throw some dry ice in there. And then you have like a spooky, science-y thing, especially in, around Halloween. Now, my second favorite one is called the oscillating clock. And so if you've seen this before, please don't ruin it. Goggles on. This one right here is 35% hydrogen peroxide. Okay, that's all it is, H2O2. Okay. Looks like water. Can you guys see back there? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> the second one is a combination of potassium iodate and sulfuric acid. Very, very small, like 0 0.07 molar, like nothing. You could drink it, don't, you could though. Okay, still like water, right? Still like water. And then the last one has a couple different components in there. There's a malonic acid, there's some starch. There we go. Ooh. Oh, what? Oh my gosh, it's magic! And then you go, no, it's science. And so you can get people interested in it. And so what just happened here, and I'm gonna let it sit for just a second. I don't wanna touch it, because I don't wanna ruin it. Ooh, ooh, oh my gosh, what's happening? What's happening? Yeah. Whoa! And then, oh my God, it goes back again. Whoa, it's crazy! Yay! Okay. And so what we have here is an oscillating clock. And for those of you who have not seen it before, it depends on which scientists you talk to, because we all have very strong opinions about what's going on. I'm going to simplify it and tell you my personal opinion. Can you guys see? I can pick it up. So it's just going to keep oscillating. Here, I'll put it up here. There we go. And so basically what happens is we have three different solutions with a lot of different materials. So simple terms, you have A plus B, which gives you C. Now when you've made C, it's in the presence of D. D's already sitting there. C plus D then gives you B. B then reacts with the A that's left over, and then you create C. C reacts with D, gives you B, that gives you A, and then you have this big mechanism. And so it's two competing reactions. And so in my classroom, I can talk about this with kinetics. I can do thermodynamics if you want to touch it and feel that it's slightly hot, not very much, but slightly hot. And then you really, ooh, you can talk about it with mechanism. Isn't that awesome? I love this reaction. Ah, it's so cool. Thank you. You guys are easy to please after a long day, so it's good. Um, and so for me, there's an element of magic, which is something that I love. It's something I fell in love with when I was 15, and it's just incredible, and it always brings me back. I want to find other reactions that are like this so I can bring it into my classroom and have new, fresh reactions to keep them engaged. Okay, so now the next thing I love, last thing, you can eat it sometimes for chemistry. It depends. And so I'm going to try to see this. I've got a styrofoam cup with marshmallows. Ooh, okay. And then I have a bucket trapping my liquid nitrogen. Ooh. Ah. So now liquid nitrogen is extraordinarily cold. It's 77 Kelvin or negative 194 Celsius. What's room temperature in Celsius? 25. I'll take it. Good. Okay. So 25 here. 
negative 200. Do you stick your hand in liquid nitrogen? No. no. Do you eat liquid nitrogen? Do you eat marshmallows that have been sitting in liquid nitrogen? Yeah. Yes, you do. Okay. So does anybody actually want to try this? Okay, here you go, ma'am. <laughs> Hands like this. I'm going to put one marshmallow in your hand. It's going to feel like the coldest thing you've ever felt. Think cold ice cube, okay? So then you're going to do two blows. <laughs> it is not... <laughs> okay, it is real two blows. <laughs> two blows. <laughs> right in your mouth. Two, 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 and swallow. Got it? Your mouth can handle the temperature way better than your hands. You good? What about the metal in my fillings? Okay. Oh, yeah, maybe we'll skip you. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case. How about I'll just do it? Okay. So this is the thing that I love to do at birthday parties. And I'll just do four since we're short on time, but usually I build up to this. Mmm. Yummy. Mmm. So exciting. Oh, it's so gross. I'm so sick of marshmallows. Okay. Anyway. God, I eat these like four times a day. It's okay, though. Now, so... <laughs> What I do with this demonstration is I try to talk to my students about a chemical change and a physical change. So the first thing I say is right here in this cup, is it a chemical or a physical change? Physical, beautiful, right? Because it's a marshmallow and liquid nitrogen. It starts as a marshmallow, ends as a marshmallow. If it turned into a milkshake or a cheeseburger, then it would definitely be a chemical change, but it didn't. Still boring marshmallow. Then you eat it, goes down here, chemical or physical? Chemical, right? What's in your stomach? Acid. And so the acid reacts with the marshmallow, definitely have a chemical change. A way to check that, if you don't believe me, is if that marshmallow were to come back out of your system, would you then want to eat it again? No. It's a completely different thing. It is not a marshmallow. And so this is something that I can do to engage my students. Uh, for those of you who want to try this at home, I would say sixth grade or higher. Um, fifth graders still have a little bit of an issue getting it into their uh, mouth fast enough that you just don't want to burn any hands. Okay. The second thing, another eating one. And this is an old demonstration, but it's new to me, so we're going to pretend it's new because it's really exciting. So this is a crystallization dish. And what I have is 2% calcium chloride. Everything I'm talking about today in this demonstration can be purchased on Amazon. And if you buy food grade, you can eat it. But I had to ship mine in my uh, box. TSA didn't like it, but it's okay. And so I can't eat it because it was with my other chemicals. But you could in theory. So these are sodium alginate. And it's 2% sodium alginate, and I've actually spiked it with a little bit of food coloring. I've got purple, orange, and green. And so what I'm going to do is just slowly put this in here. I'm going to do some little dots and some strings. Let's get some other colors in here. And basically what you do is you add these two together, and then you have a very important process, which is where you count to five. So you go one, two, three, four, and five. Then you put your hand in. <gasps> Ooh, it's gummy worms. <laughs> And you could eat this, 100%. Now, again, like I said, these traveled with my chemicals, so I'm not going to eat it because I want to have a nice weekend in Manhattan. Uh, <laughs> but you could. And so now you make gummy worms. And this was maybe $17 on Amazon to spend for all the materials, and you could do this over and over and over again. Fancy adults, if you've ever been to a really nice cocktail place and you have a martini and they have that little olive in there, that's how they make it. And so it's used from sodium alginate. Alginate's extracted from seaweed. It tastes disgusting. So if you want a little bit of a way to make this taste better, I I actually use watermelon puree. So you take a watermelon, you smash it up, you get the liquid, and you dissolve the alginate in your watermelon puree, and it tastes like watermelon gummy worms. Ah, yay! Okay, yay! Did you like that one? Have you guys seen that before? No? Oh, good, good, good. Okay, you can totally do that at home. Kids, kids love it. Um, the problem is if you're trying to be fancy and create your olive with a martini, because that's what I wanted to do, it's impossible. I seriously do not know how those chefs do it. They are so talented to be able to make that. I can't do it. Moving on. So now I'm going to take a quick break and tell you about my outreach program. This is called Fun with Chemistry. And what I do is I go out to local Austin schools and I blow stuff up and I try to show kids that science is fun and entertaining and you don't have to be a nerd to like science because, oh, that drives me crazy. You can just be a normal girl who likes to play with fire or bombs, probably not bombs, liquid <laughs> nitrogen, something like that. Anybody can do this. Literally anybody can do it. And it drives me crazy that there's some kind of stigma with that. But what we do is we try to interact with 20,000 students every year. I've hit that every year except for last year. Oh, I got 19,200. And when I realized that in August, I was like, how do I get 800? students together in August so I can hit my 20,000 number, but I didn't, which is why I'm here, so that I can do more presentations this year and hopefully get over that number. 
We started in fall 2014. It was just me. I basically went out and wanted to show kids that science was cool. And from the word of mouth, we basically exploded in Austin. And now we're so popular that we have a lottery system. And so our schools have to um, submit a lottery. Our computer randomly generates the winners. And then we figure out where to go. My heart is with Title I schools, for those of you who know what that is. So the ones that might maybe lower socioeconomic um, places where students have never seen liquid nitrogen. Because at least in Austin, we have two different groups. There's the west side with the kids who basically have a tank of liquid nitrogen in their bedroom, and then there's the east side with the kids who have never seen it before. And so my heart always is on the east side. We just got to spread that love, show, show kids the liquid nitrogen. But this is really where it comes from, for me personally. I hate that image. I hate it. He's my idol. I want to be him someday, but oh, the bow tie. Like, oh, I don't, no, I don't like it. And then... <laughs> These girls, like they're in cardigans. I don't wear cardigans and no knock on cardigans. If you're a girl who wears cardigans and you love it, that's you, but that's not me. And so I really want to change that. I want there to be scientists on TV that look like me, that I can associate with so I can relate to it. So if there's girls like me at age four, they can be like, oh, that's me too. So we'll just go ahead and do that. Okay, none of that, I'm over that. Anybody can be a scientist, okay? Photoshop's fantastic. You know, you can do a lot with fire. Anybody can be a scientist. It doesn't matter where your parents are from, what your race is, what your gender is, your sexual orientation, how much money you have. If you like fire, you can be a scientist. <laughs> All right, so now, I'm trying to go quickly, sorry. But um, three things I've learned on my journey. Now, I want to be very clear. I'm 31, okay? I have a lot to learn, hopefully about 100 more years. Probably not, but maybe. I have a lot to learn. And so these are my personal lessons that I've learned on this way. And the first thing is learning can be fun. In fact, it can be really, really fun. And so my personal favorite way to demonstrate that is with Charles Law. So I have a class of 500 students. I could stand up here and go on and on and on about the relationship between volume and temperature. And I could take it to a microscopic level and say, okay, if we lower the kinetic energy, that means we're lowering the heat. So we're lowering the number of collisions, which means we're lowering the number of collisions to the wall, which means that the pressure is going down. The volume is going down. You could blah, 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 all and all, all. Boring. Or I could say, this is a balloon. Yes, it's a dog. Ooh. Okay, I should have my gloves on. Uh, put that, don't put this. <laughs> ah. Temperature went down, volume went down. Now I'm in room temperature. Volume's going up, or temperature's going up, volume's going up. Done. All right, now you are all going, well, uh, oh, oh, there we go. <laughs> Now you're all going to remember that volume and temperature are directly proportional. I could have gone for 20 minutes on that microscopic explanation, or I could have done this. It takes one minute, and now hopefully you are going to remember that for the rest of your life. But now here's the thing. You always have to do something else. You can't just show it to them. You have to do something else. So the question is, will this work with something bigger? Now let's try it. Okay. Shout out to Nikki for getting me helium balloons. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so here's my octopus. I had to cut a leg, so it only has seven legs. Please forgive me. Okay. Ooh. Ah. Ooh. You guys are an easy crowd to impress. <laughs> All right. So now again, we're just trying to talk about volume versus temperature and see if that works. And so what I like to do is just change it up a little bit. Right? So we use legs. It doesn't have to be just the dog. In this case, it's an octopus with seven legs. But then what I like to do is throw a little bit of fun onto it. Come on, come on. Yes, there you go. Come on, dude. It's trying. It's trying. Let me encourage you. Oh, snap. <laughs> He's a little cold still. But in theory, that's a cool octopus, right? Yes? <laughs> So if the students don't know that the head is filled with holly, helium, the second it starts floating around and usually chasing me, if I can get the wind current correct, and be like, oh, what's happening? Oh, my goodness. They are now curious, right? Back at you. Yeah, there you go. So now they're curious, and they're, again, they're going to remember. And so you can take this to another conversation and say, why? Why does it float? Well, now you're talking about density. Now you're talking about helium. Now you're talking about the concentration in the atmosphere. So many different reasons. But what they're going to remember Volume and temperature are directly proportional, and octopuses are awesome. Okay, that's what they'll remember. Is it octopi? Poi. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> the second thing. 
There are multiple ways to solve a problem. I grew up in what, in my opinion, was a very black and white household where there's a right answer and a wrong answer, especially in the STEM field. There's often a right answer and a wrong answer, and you can usually uh, calculate the right and wrong answer. But technically, there are many different ways to solve a problem. And so I have two different demonstrations here to kind of show you um, how you could possibly decompose hydrogen peroxide using two different ways. But this is something that applies to everything, I think so. So the first one I want to show you is something that I love to do around Halloween time, so thank you for inviting me out here during this time. And so traditionally we call it genie in a bottle, but during this month we're going to call it ghost in a bottle. And so what I'm going to do is hope that no one who owns this building is in the room. Okay, good. I'm going to do about 200 mils, again, hydrogen peroxide. I actually bought this directly off Amazon and Amazon Prime this year, so you can, you can do that if you don't want to go through Fisher. It is more expensive. Get out of here. Okay. <laughs> Here's our hydrogen peroxide. Now he's floating. I don't want you to ruin my demo. Get out of here. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so now I've got my hydrogen peroxide again in an Erlenmeyer flask, and this time I'm going to use one catalyst. This is manganese trioxide, okay? And it's very, very simple. It's slightly expensive, but we actually reuse ours. We're an outreach program, so we reuse everything we can. Okay, here we go. Let's see if we can make a ghost up here. Just thinking about it. I don't want it to be too big. I can add more. Okay, I'm going to add more, but nobody yell at me if this gets big. Oh, it's going, it's going, it's going. Come on, dude. It's going. Oh, yes. There we go. Ooh. Ah. And so what we're doing right here is we're decomposing hydrogen peroxide. Okay, that was good. I didn't set off any alarms. That was good. Okay, good, good. <laughs> I'm trying to do, usually what I do is I shoot it up to the ceiling, and so I'm trying to do the smallest scale possible so that I get invited back. Please, I'm having fun. Um, and so, again, this is one way to decompose hydrogen peroxide. So H2O2, you add a catalyst, you break it apart. So what we saw was gas come out of the top. This is a great way that you can talk to your students. What is that gas? What's well, oxygen gas? What's going to happen if I light it on fire? Problem, right? So we'd, we'd have that conversation. And then you can take it to thermodynamics aspect because this is incredibly hot. So it's exothermic. You can talk about that. So this is genie in a bottle, hydrogen peroxide. I use manganese trioxide to decompose it. Ooh. Okay, now my favorite one. Josh. He's never been my assistant before. <laughs> Just happened to be here. Thank you, honey. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is my favorite version of that. Same type of thing, I'm going to use hydrogen peroxide. This time I'm going to use all of it because I can't fly back with it, so we might as well just <laughs> break it apart. <laughs> Everyone always asks me, how do you fly through there? And I'm like, TSA knows me by name. <laughs> by name. And they're like, hey, come here. Why don't you just come sit next to me during this reaction? I'm like, oh, God. They uh, go through everything. We'll see how Manhattan likes me. Hydrogen peroxide, Dawn dish soap. You do not have to use Dawn dish soap, but I'm obsessed with penguins, and they save the penguins, so we always use Dawn, but there's no chemical reason why you can do this, okay? You can use any soap you want. Then, add some food coloring. I'm from UT, so we're going orange. I don't know if I can make it burnt orange, but we're going to try. Okay, so red and yellow. There's science right there, right? Yeah, science. Then we're going to mix it up. Okay, so same thing. Hydrogen peroxide. And now I'm going to add my catalyst of potassium iodide. Again, I'm hoping this does not make a big mess. Oh, please don't make a big mess. But just like a kind of, kind of small mess. Tiny mess would be good. All right, come on, dude. Come on. Yes, it's going. Oh, I'll clean it up. I'll clean it up. <laughs> that is the best one I've ever done. Oh, my God. Oh. I promise I'll clean it up. I promise I'll clean it up. It's just this so the solution, or the moral of that story, is there's two different ways to do the demonstration. Usually one is a good way, and one, so see, it's still going, it's just a little bit more late. I'm so sorry, Nikki. Okay, I promise I'll clean it, I promise I'll clean it. Okay, I actually don't care, because that was awesome, this is elephant physics. And so, the thing is I'm trying to say is there's multiple ways to solve a problem, and there's not one way, and so... And so 
And so the big thing that I want to tell you, though, is to have an open mind. And usually when you're with a diverse group of people, you can usually come up with a better solution or a better way of doing things. Even though sometimes working with a diverse group can be kind of challenging, you can usually come up with a better product and a better solution. So that's my one thing. All right, so the last thing I want to tell you is my last lesson, and that's to try. And that is something that my dad instilled on me when I was four years old, and I played soccer all my life. And the thing he was telling me is, I don't care if they scored on you. I don't care if you fall down. I don't care. All I care about is if you try. And I've really taken that message to me my whole life. It's just try. I don't care if you hit the ceiling. I don't care if you do something else. What I care about is that you try and you do your best. And that's the most important thing to me. And so I use that in chemistry. I use that in my life with everything that I have. Just try. You have to try. And the biggest thing that I tell my students is apply to everything. Apply to every scholarship apply to every program, let somebody else tell you no. Who cares if they tell you no? But just try. You have to try because they might say yes. And if they say yes, then you get to go to Manhattan and make a big mess. <laughs> All right, so, oh God, I'm worried about my next one now, to be honest, but I'm doing it anyway. Okay, so I'm going to keep it small. I'll keep it small, I promise. So I'm going to go over there on the other tarp. And this is my favorite demonstration of all time. Let me cover that. And so what I've got here is liquid nitrogen, okay, 77 Kelvin, negative 194 Celsius. And over here, I have hot water in just a water heater, okay. And especially after what I just did, I'm going to keep this smaller. And so when I first started, what I would do is something kind of tiny like this. I was like, oh, that's kind of boring. I was like, oh, that's a little bit bigger. And so now when I go out and do my fun with chemistry outreach presentations, this is my finale. But I don't use that little bucket. I actually use that green bucket, which I've decided not to use here. And so <laughs> I'm just doing it. Sorry, girl. Okay, here we go. Thank you guys so much. I've had such a great time. This is my favorite demonstration, and you have to try. You've got to go big or go home. Here we go. <laughs> Yay! Oh, good, good, good. Uh, I lost my clicker. There it is. That's my favorite demonstration. And with that, you can talk about so many different things. It's an endothermic process. It's a physical change. It's absolutely fantastic. And so that's one of my main things. Oh, and now this isn't working anymore either. Everything stopped on me. It's okay. Okay, so here's the thing. Our motto at UT is what starts here changes the world. I was lost at 22 when I showed up to Austin, Texas. I had no idea who I was, no idea what I was going to be. I never even thought that I was going to be a teacher, let alone in front of people blowing stuff up, playing with fire. I had no clue. And so you've got to try. You've got to go for it and just be open to, to whatever possibilities come to your way and just have fun with it. So the last thing I want to do is say thank you to Nikki and Perla and Leah and Susan for dealing with all of my logistical nightmares with FedEx and <laughs> Amazon Prime and getting this liquid nitrogen tank delivered to a library. I don't even know how you did that. You're fantastic. So thank you to them. I also have a great team back in Austin who helped me do everything, so I couldn't do anything without them. So Eric, Taylor, Dax, you're amazing. For any of you, thank you guys so much for coming. I really appreciate your time. If you have any questions whatsoever about what you saw here, about what you should do and not do, please, you can contact me right here. My personal website is Kate the Chemist. If you have any good pictures, videos, anything, please tag me on Twitter and Instagram, at funwithchem. If I look bad, don't you dare tag me. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. I'd be happy to answer any questions.